Hey folks, we're back again for another episode examining the Yavana Jataka, the oldest horoscopic text of India. And uh, on today's episode, we're going to do uh, chapters 19 through 26. And we're going to explore some very interesting techniques and perspectives. As always, some of them familiar through later Jyotish texts that reproduced some of the same techniques, other ones, uh, you know, quite unique and and quite novel. So, uh, Fernando, welcome. Thanks for joining me again. Nice to see you, Lars. Let's continue this wonderful analysis. <laughs> All right, I'm going to screen share. Okay, you can see it? Yes, sir, I can. Can you? I think so. Okay. <laughs> so, we start now with chapter 19, and chapter 19 has to do with basically Lagna descriptions. Yeah. I, I really like this chapter. This chapter is really good. I think this is another uh, little nugget that uh, Yavana Yataka has. Uh, I really like the descriptions. I don't know what you think about them, but I really like them. Um, yeah, I, I liked them. Uh, they're admittedly not my, they're not my favorite descriptions uh, for ascendant stuff from old texts, uh, but they're from, from Jyotish, Jyotish particularly. Uh, well, from Jyotish, I, I don't know if I really have anything to compare it to, to be okay. honest. Uh, what yeah. other descriptions would you like? Are you you're referring to maybe some Hellenistic text or, or? Yeah, I really like Firmicus Maternus's descriptions okay. for Firmicus. some reason. Okay. I just really like those. But uh, these are excellent as well. Um, is, are there any you wanted to read? No, not really. Do you want to read yours and mine? <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm Virgo, so I guess I'm up yeah. first. Where's yours? Leo and... Okay, it's right here. Virgo, there you go. I'll read part of it. I don't know if I need to read all of this. God. <laughs> if the sixth sign Virgo is in the ascendant, the native is one who talks softly and clearly, attached to generosity, service, and affection. Compassionate man addicted to music and clever in <laughs> litigation, poetry, courtesy, and sweetness. Well, I am addicted to music. Uh, I have a degree in music and... I am, uh, I have been told I would make a good lawyer, though I don't know that I'm going to go that route. <laughs> and then, um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I like poetry and uh, I think I'm courteous, but no, I'm not courteous all the time. I'll, I'll admit that. I'm <laughs> okay. Nobody is, so don't worry about <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, I don't plan to have children. A man with few children. Uh, you, don't, you, you don't know what life has for you. So yeah. You know? Inwardly a cheat who desires glory. Uh, there, there's some truth to that. <laughs> um, a well-behaved person who wanders in foreign countries and has two natures. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, lover who desires strength, pleasing objects, and glory. Handsome, lucky person whose shoulders and sides droop. I don't know. They might. My shoulders and sides might sometimes droop, especially when I'm sitting, just like, you know, like, uh, and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, overall, it's, um, it's, it's pretty accurate, I would say, just generally. One who's opposed by evil together with ignoble men. Um, I have been, I guess. So that makes me an ignoble man. <laughs> <laughs> One who's stimulated even among virtuous ladies and who makes an effort in many activities. No and, and, if, <laughs> <laughs> and if you see the descriptions, these are very intertwined with the descriptions of the Rashis we, we saw on earlier chapters, which I really like. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and beloved among the elders, like, that's definitely true. I have a lot of friends who are much, much older than me, so that's kind of cool to see that. And Anyway, uh, we'll go to yours now, I guess, uh, Sagittarius. Sagittarius, yeah. Sag. Sag, yeah. Sag. Okay, there it is. Sagittarius in the Ascendant. Let me take this window up. Sagittarius in the Ascendant. The native is a man with large teeth, dirty, black lips, <laughs> a fleshy, fleshy thighs, belly, arms, and chest, a shy person with big eyes and a broad and high head. Yeah, more or less. One <laughs> whose mind is full of science, learning, and sacred traditions. Yeah, a definitely. man whose intellect is fresh and who is endowed with firmness and courage. One whose anger is fierce 
but who serves those who are obsequious to him. A man who can overcome by bowing, who can be overcome by bowing, but will not tolerate the insults of the mighty. That's, that's very nice. That's very poetic. Yeah. Am I a man with ugly nails? Man, this is something that always happens when you see descriptions for Sagittarius. Ugly nails? Yeah, they. I mean, I remember that in Brihad Yataka, the moon in Sagittarius has this song. You know, I don't have ugly nails, but people with predominant uh, Sagittarius positions should look at, at their nails, you know. Wow. They should, huh. they should be going to pedis and manis, uh, pedicures and manicures to, to get those things right. But whatever, let's continue. Weird. Uh, uh, who is the head of his family and has subdued his foes, a hero among his companions, who is preeminent for his good policy, one whose wife is from an unstable family and that has many defects, <laughs> a man who loves his clan and is friendly to his relatives. That's more or less true. One who is victorious through his brothers and has many firm sons. A man who is injured in his mouth, eyes, armpits, feet, and head. A person of pleasing help, helpfulness who is rich in excellent wives. See, that, that contradicts what I've just read, you know. You're yeah, gonna... I've noticed that too. Sometimes he like yeah. totally contradicts the, the yeah. paragraph right before. <laughs> Those, those were the mushrooms he was eating while he was writing this. One who destroys the wealth of those who laugh at good dharma or our lives. That's I like a, that one. Yeah, I like that one. Yeah, that's very, very uh, Batman-ish. Like. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a civil person who rejoices in good actions such as the craft, one who gets his money from the king and has phlegmatic and windy nature, a man who dies because of various ailments or because of the seas of the belly and fevers. Thank God no genitalia reference here so far. Yeah. Or because of animals which live in the water or in holes. So I'm going to be huh. bitten by a Scorpio or I am going to die in a restaurant. Oh, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's strange. I, I, you know, I would associate the animals in water or holes more with Scorpio. More Scorpio, yeah. Hmm. That, that, yeah, you see, these, these little things make you... Um, you know, make you uh, question yourself about the integrity of this text about, you know. Yeah. Th these little things, I mean, maybe the, the one, Svadishvuya. Svadishvaya. 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 Maybe, I don't know, he transcribed it and maybe he wasn't really aware of the things he was writ writing. I don't know. Who knows, but, right? But yeah. these little things are, are, you know, raise little flags. Uh, yeah. You, if you understand what I mean, yeah. Well, and I think possibly too, uh, it, it's written like this again because the the author wants those who read it to really think about it and not just like, you know, it's not something that the average person can just read and and master easily. So um, sometimes maybe these older authors would say things that were like contradictory or shocking yeah. just to, to protect the knowledge yeah. and just to get, yeah. And just to get you to think about it. Um, I wanted to look at 61 and 62 at the end of this chapter. Sure, sure, sure. That's kind of interesting things. Um, so the first is about Dwada uh, thus by means of the 12 portions when they are in the ascendant, which means that basically, um, and that's all I need to read of that. What he's implying is that you also look at the Dwada Samsha that the Ascendant falls in and interpret it in the same way as you would the Ascendant. And theoretically, whichever Lord is stronger, you know, uh, is going to give you maybe the, the more accurate one. Um, and so it's interesting because usually in the modern day, people do this more with the, the Navamsha but he's telling you explicitly to do it with the Dwada Samsha. And I think that makes more sense because Dwada Samsha in this text is explicitly related to the signs, whereas the Navamsha seems to be a mixture of a little bit of sign influence, but mostly planet. The Navamsha is mostly linked to the planet that rules the Navamsha. So, um, so in Yavana Jataka, he wants you to use Dwada Samshas for anything sign-based, for the refinement of the signs. And Which then, is something we've talked about in other videos before. Yeah. And then whatever sign is joined with its Lord 
or with a planet which has its exaltation in it or aspected by those planets or strong on its own, earlier in the text, Yavana Jataka actually gives rules for which planets are strong in which houses or which signs are strong in which houses. Very interesting. I don't remember all the rules, but um, quite literally, these, these signs are strong on the ascendant. These are strong on the midheaven, stuff like that. And then that sign is said to have the greatest influence, having regard for its. Sorry, place. I'm sorry, Lars. Can you can you underline what you're reading? So. Oh yeah, sorry. Sixty-two. Yes. Um, so yeah, if uh, if the sign is joined with its lord or its exaltation lord or aspected by those planets or strong on its own, as I just described, that sign is said to have the greatest influence, having regard for its place. The opposite of this is said by others. Um, so I, the opposite is, of this is said by others. I don't know. I think he's just. I think it's just meaning that like if they don't have their their um, lord or exaltation lord aspecting, they're weak. Um, I don't think he's saying other authors disagree with this, but <laughs> it could be wrong. Anyway, the point is is that here he 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 again reaffirms this idea that we can understand like a sign's innate strength and thus the the house it rules by seeing whether or not its lord or its exaltation lord aspect it. And earlier in the text, he also points to Mercury and Jupiter and even Venus as kind of the three sort of benefic planets, even though Mercury is neutral. Um, and I just, I just wanted to point that out because I think it's important to remember and it gives us an insight into thinking about like sign strength, not just planetary strength. Yeah, I agree. Cool. Okay, so chapter 20, we get, uh, what, all the planets in the Ascendant, and yes, then... Yes, planets in Lagna, planets aspecting them. planets in Lagna. So it's it's just, you know, basic cookbook uh, recipe, uh, shlokas. So it's, it's really nice. I don't know if you want to read yours, or we want to continue, however you feel like. I sadly don't have any planets in my Ascendant. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, you're not one of the lucky ones, so... <laughs> Yeah. I have I have Uranus, so let's look for Uranus. All right. <laughs> oh, that was I think joke. it's on the next page. No, yeah, I think it's like in the next, next, next page. Yeah, <laughs> two thousand <laughs> yeah. years worth of pages the, later. Uh, the new, the new abridged twentieth century version. The the new abridged nineteenth century version. Early nineteenth century. No, no, no. I have Mercury exactly. and Saturn in, in Lagna. Okay. Um. Yeah. If you wanted to read those, Mercury yeah, is yeah, right yeah, here. Sure. Mercury in the Ascendant produces a weak man <laughs> with a black body. <laughs> Getting a black body thing going you know, on. I'm, I'm, I have a lot of hair. So, so maybe, I don't know, that, that traduces with, with well, black. You, you have to think in India, too. Like it's, like, it's like saying, you know, a darker skinned person, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, which, which, which I am. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm like a little bit black, but... You know, <laughs> people are not gonna people are not gonna accept that. But you know, okay. basically, race is a social construct, uh, Lars. So you can be whatever you want. So <laughs> I want to identify as a middle-aged black woman. So this applies to me. Yeah, I'm gonna identify as a unicorn. Yeah, that's a very nice. Good for you. God bless. Tolerance is 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 key. Okay, Mercury in the ascendant produces a weak man with a black body who is a distinguished poet and has mastered many signs. A servant with good handwriting, an intelligent man who is clever at speaking. Okay. Yeah, I guess you could say that. You know, I don't I don't think my ex girlfriends would say that, but yeah, continue. So um, Saturn in the ascendant produces a fool. There we go. <laughs> this is me. Whose conduct is unrighteous. Alarma, diablo, alarma. A weak rogue with a black body. Once again, black reference. <laughs> man, yeah. Are you a sure great, you got the right chart? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. A great, a great man with immense wealth who at the end of his life is penniless. The greatest of his relatives. So yeah, I guess. Nice. We got a nice mixture there. So. But hey, man, you know, I, I I do notice that in a lot of your pictures, like on your website, aren't you wearing all black plus yeah. the black hat? Yeah. So that's because, a very, there you go. But I do that because of Saturn in my ascendant. Right. There you go. So, I mean, it's, it's it doesn't like have pain, to be pain. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm using this hat. You know, I, I, use, this, yeah. I use this because I like uh, Shivas Chandra Walsa, who was an Indian nationalist. But I mean, cool. The idea is to use black because Saturn is in my lagna. So I'm just paying trivia to, to Saturn. But it's, 
I've always liked that hat and that hat is very Saturnic because it's very like simple, you know, yeah. it's very straightforward, just simple. And, you know, I, and I'm bold. So, you know, it's, it's a way, and, it, and also for marketing, you know, you just uh, use it so people know, yeah, that's the guy with the hat. So yeah, sure. I've thought yeah. about uh, wearing yeah. a hat as well. Yeah. Uh, the thing is we'll that see. you gotta, you gotta have the balls for it because, you know, <laughs> Yeah, once you once you wear start wearing hats, you can't really stop, can you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Video. And you know, I I look better with a hat. But yeah, it's basically the blackness is for for Saturn, who's in my Lagna. And you know, Saturn in Lagna is probably a no. I don't want to say a difficult position, but but you know, he doesn't get a lot of directional strength there. So I'm just trying right. To Mercury do a little, does though. Yes, definitely. Mercury and Mercury's right. Direction. Yeah, Mercury's right in my ascendant. So And he's in his joy, which is a Hellenistic technique that Correct. unfortunately we don't see reproduced right. in Yavana Jataka for some reason. But uh, No, you don't see that really in Yotish because what no. you what you get is later I mean we're digressing here, but uh the joys of the planets in Yotish are, are basically done by Baba Karkas. And mm -hmm. they're not I mean I don't know if I'm wrong, but I believe that's basically a modern construct. If I could be oh, mistaken. Baba Karkas? Well, s y yes and no, because you even do find them in the Hellenistic tradition loosely. Like they'll say. No, I mean in Jyotish. Right, right. I know. But I, what I mean is like, like, for example, you'll find that, and you find it in Parashara too, like Mars signifies brothers, you know, sun. No, 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 no. I, I, don't, I don't mean that. I mean... Um, Oh, okay. Yes, yes, I know what you mean. The, yeah. those are carcass. I mean, Baba Carcass. The idea that, you know, the first house is basically allotted to um, uh, the, the, the sun. The second house is Jupiter. The third house is Mars. The fourth house is, is Moon. The fifth house, Jupiter. The sixth house. Mars I think, Saturn, yeah, I think those are more modern. Venus. Yeah, those are modern. Those and, are more many, modern. and many astrologers use different ones. You know, I've sure. heard of the 10th having like five. Uh, the le the the ninth has two the sun and Jupiter. However, in Hellenistic uh, writings, you have it right there. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. The first one is Mercury. The third one is the Moon. Um, the sixth is Mars. Fifth, yeah, fifth house is Venus, and then Mars is the sixth. Fifth is Venus. Sun sixth, ninth. Sun is ninth, and Jupiter is eleven. And then Saturn twelfth. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. And uh, yeah, I was just rereading. Um, for those interested, a great. Uh, essay by Chris Brennan that's uh, that's free on one of his websites. Um, on, it, should, uh, it should be the Hellenistic Astrology website, right? Yeah, I found it through uh, looking up Joy's on his uh, astrology uh, encyclopedia or whatever it's called. Um, the astrology, it's not it's not encyclopedia, but it's something like that. And um, yeah, there's a link to his essay, and he actually also analyzes how the the joys may also have given rise to the triplicity sect. lords. Yes. Well, sect and triplicity lords, which is yes. and and thus elements, which is fascinating. It's really that's fascinating. in his book, actually. That's in his. Is book. it okay? Cool. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 really fascinating research. So I'd recommend that. I think there's something to it, but, um, but yeah. Anyway. Uh, Oh, oh go, go, coming really, back to Yamaya. coming back to this, yeah. I I wanted to look at uh, the eighth shloka here real quick in this chapter. That's yeah, um, if planets are in the houses or vargas of their enemies, are overcome or have diminished brilliance, they are said to be weak. If they are malefic or aspected by malefics, they destroy good influences, lives, and bodies. So there's nothing unique about this shloka, but I just think it's interesting that he's like reminding excuse me, reminding you here in the discussion of this that you want to uh, make sure to check the dignities, right? And the same will be true for the opposite of what he's saying here, that planets in their own houses or Vargas of their friends or their own Vargas and so on. Um, and then, you know, diminished brilliance could easily pertain to uh, light. So if they're close to being combust or if they are combust, things like that, could play a role and so on. And so I just I just wanted to point that out that this is like really important in Yavana Jataka and that while we read a text like this, we don't want to get swept up in the cookbook nature of it because it's not really like that at the end of the day. So here Yeah, that's that's the thing. He always says that at the end of the descriptions. <laughs> yeah. <Does it? laughs> Which is really interesting. It's like, you know, have have you seen Doctor Strange, the movie? 
Yeah, I love that at movie. The, at the end, he says the, the, the warnings are always at the end after the spell. So it's more or less the same principle. Oh, yeah, he says that, doesn't yeah. he? That's yeah, yeah. that's great. That's great. I, I love Doctor Strange. I, oh I really, yeah. I, I I bet all astrologers like Doctor Strange. Ah, it's wonderful. It's yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Okay, so then yeah, these following shlokas we just have uh you know when a planet's in the ascendant, aspected by all six other planets, and this is any aspect. Okay, yes, so that's what I wanted to mention. This could be sign aspect, planetary aspect, or oh. even. You know, traditional tajik aspect which would be hellenistic aspects by you know well square, crying sex style yeah what, what yeah yeah i i just mean uh yeah we can apply all of that to this but i just mean as far as the aspect doctrine that the yavana jataka gives if we just think about that the yavana jataka is saying all aspects so it's not just saying like only conjunction opposition or only Jupiter, Saturn, Mars special aspects, because Jupiter, Saturn, Mars don't have special aspects according to this text. It's a later development. So what which, I mean by Which that, would be interesting to know where it came from. You know, the yeah. the the eighth and and, and um, the eighth and fourth aspect of Mars, the the tenth and third of Saturn and and the trigona of Jupiter of fifth and ninth. I mean nobody really knows where they came from. Yeah, hopefully we'll figure it out one day. But there's there's all kinds of circular logic surrounding that. Like people try to explain it. And nobody explains it the same way. By the well, way, well, the problem is is that people are their their circular logic is um is uh, begging the question. Like you already have the answer. You're already assuming that this is this is correct. And now I just have to explain it like yeah. going backwards. But I I have never found that to um to make any sense and, and oh I, my god that's heresy lars Panel. yeah oh heresy god. right because most modern astrologers you are, are doing a that, heretic. you are not gonna get invited to any conference my god. i know yeah sadly i've, I've only been invited to two yeah and <laughs> you're not inviting me back <laughs> damn they're gonna just throw me out right when they get when i get there they're gonna be like what <laughs> get the fuck out of here anyway um <laughs> The uh, Yeah, so we don't know where those special aspects come from, but if we just stick to what this text says, and we talked about in a couple of videos, ag videos ago that the aspect doctrine, um, you know, may actually be the same as the Hellenistic doctrine, although it, it, it gives uh, the eighth aspect instead of the, uh, the eleventh aspect. Um, which, so, by the way, let's for people who don't know what the yeah. Hellenistic aspect doctrine is, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's basically squares, uh, trines, sextiles, oppositions, and conjunctions. Correct? Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So um, my friend and I, I like we discussed this in the first video you and I did of this series that the 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 shlokas outlining the aspect doctrine in chapter one say that you know, basically from the 11th, you don't get an aspect and, but you do get one from the eighth. And, and I'm convinced that that's uh, that's a mistake of some kind. And that a it's typo should, you mentioned. Yes. Yeah. That I think it should be the same as the Hellenistic aspect doctrine. So you have to decide obviously what, what you're going to go with. But if I was just going with applying the Hellenistic aspect doctrine, my point is that, like if I have a planet in the 11th, it's aspecting my ascendant. And they may not be a full aspect, right? Because Yavana Jataka only affords 25% uh, to such an aspect. But it's still an aspect. And so everything he says here, you have to take into account with all the aspects, not just the special or most powerful aspects. Of course, those are going to be the highest influence, you know, right. the conjunction, opposition. Yeah. But, um, but you know, in any case, uh, you, you've got, like, for example, in my chart, I've got only three planets aspecting my ascendant and the rest don't aspect. So uh, two of them, you know, are, are by weaker aspects and one of them is by opposition. So that has the strongest effect, but the other ones still have an effect. And the weaker it, aspects would be sextiles? A uh, sextile and a trine, which are going to be, you know, in various grades of weaker, according to Yavana Jataka. So um, do you have, what do you have aspecting your ascendant? My Lagna? Uh, really? Well, you mean the, the Lagna degree or the planets in Lagna? 
No, just by sign, just by the whole sign. By sign, no, I don't. I don't have any. I don't have any sign. Uh, any uh, Rashi Drishti. No, 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 I, not I Rashi have, Drishti. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going one by one. Uh, okay. Planetary wise, I have a sextile. I have a Mars sextile. Uh, okay. Uh, from the eleventh towards the first, and that's about it. Really? And you would have Jupiter Moon casting a backwards one, right? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, 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 that okay. one. But but it's it's the dominant one comes from Mars. Yeah, that's going to be the stronger of, yeah. of those two yeah. sextiles. So yeah. did and, you want to? Jupiter and Jupiter would be aspecting the uh, the ascendant there. So it would be like a Jupiter Mars. I mean Jupiter Jupiter Moon going the uh, n- not uh dom, dom, dominating but the other way and mars dominating the aspect so i guess the strongest one would be the mars one right okay yeah i don't did you want to read it yeah or? sure let's go for it mars i think All it's right. 16 so mars aspecting i guess mercury and saturn right uh yeah yeah okay so i guess that would be wait no no 16 i think right 16 Oh, is that it? Uh, Mars. Look no, at it. Jupiter aspecting the sun. Oh, this you're is- going backwards. Okay, so the first one. Okay, Jupiter aspecting the sun. No, the moon. No, Venus. No, no, none of those. Yeah, but where is? Oh, uh, here it is. Right, here it 13, is. Thirteen. Thirteen. This is the it. Moon, yeah, the Mars. Moon uh, Mercury. <laughs> <laughs> the moon aspecting Mercury in the ascendant produces rich man. Yeah. Right. And a Saturn, a fool. So I'm going to be a rich fool. Or and I am you, a rich fool. a man whose wealth is famous. So you got that. Oh, oh so my wealth. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm going to be a <laughs> fool who's rich and whose wealth is famous. Nice. Well, you know, I'm making YouTube videos about astrology. So That's <laughs> true. Yeah. There you go. And actually, you know, I just realized something too is that this seems to be a, a, a double, like he's doing it both ways. So when, yeah. he, when he mentions the moon aspecting Mercury, that also means Mercury yeah, aspecting Mercury. the moon yes. if the moon were in the ascendant. So yes. um, that's interesting, yeah. Okay. And Mars, a Mars, the 16, a man who oh. kills his father and whose body is wasted away in performing a bow. Mercury, one who's 16, Lars, 16. Wait, 16? Yeah, Yeah, because this is Jupiter aspecting the sun. No, Sun, Moon, and Venus. There's no Mercury there. No, Mars aspecting the sun is a man who kills his father. Oh, oh. Yeah, Mercury Mercury is 14, so Mars aspecting Mercury. uh, No, but I don't don't have sun aspecting Mercury. Or no, sorry, 13, 13. So if you had Mars aspecting Mercury, right, because Mercury is in your ascendant. Yes, exactly. I'm sorry. Mars alone. But you get it down here also. <laughs> oh, do you where? Uh, right here, 16. No, this is for this is for aspects to the sun. No, the 16, 16, not 15, 16. No, both. Oh. Both are. See how he ends with the sun? Yeah, Jupiter yeah. aspecting the sun, moon there aspecting the sun. There you go. I'm yeah. a fool. <laughs> Mars. <laughs> No, it's confusing for sure. You got to, you know, like we both just got lost doing it. But um, and then we have aspects to uh, to Saturn. But see, we actually it's confusing because we yeah, we have to go up up earlier. No, I don't know. Fujitaya was was smoking. I don't get it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was smoking some good hash. Oh, no, here it is. It's up. I think it's up here. (laughs) <laughs> mars no okay i don't know i don't know whatever you, don't worry about it for those watching you'll just have to you'll have to get the text and just go through this chapter carefully and just I think can, about I it i can live without that yeah okay um, all right but I, I i wanted to talk about 21 here oh yes that's what that's yeah, yeah, yeah yeah the influence pertaining to aspect is to be established as losing its own qualities under the influence of the qualities and natures of the signs I don't get it. <laughs> I don't. I don't know what that means, and that's why I wanted to talk about it. The influence pertaining to aspect. So it's the aspect that is being produced by a planet, right? Yeah. Is to be established as losing its own qualities from the influence of the qualities and natures of the signs. Oh, I think I get it. 
I think you color the aspect with the sign energy. Is that what he means? I think he's saying that you have to combine the planetary nature with the sign it's in to yeah. get to get its influence properly. Which in would be the aspect. dignity, right? Dignity, but also like qualities, like how he gives all the planets in all the different signs, um, which he did earlier on, right? Yeah, we did that, those chapters last video. So the idea is like, you know, you combine uh, Mars with Libra, right? And then what does Mars Libra aspecting do kind of a thing. But that, that is, um, to me, that is like, uh, that is dignity, but it's also something else. I mean, that's, that's kind of like subtle, subtle fine tuning to me because, yep. you know, I just want to know in the beginning is Mars aspecting the ascendant or not. And then I know, okay, it's going to be a Martian influence and then I can refine it and say, well, okay, but it's Mars and Libra. So it's more diplomatic. It's not necessarily the person who just like runs with a flaming sword, <laughs> chopping people's heads off. <laughs> 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 like Hellboy. Okay. Yeah. Like Hellboy or something. Yeah. All right, all right. Chapter twenty-one. What do we got here again? Uh, in chapter twenty-one, we get conjunctions. Oh, right. Okay. So it's basically two-way conjunctions, uh, a classical Hellenistic aspect. So yeah. uh, I don't know if you want to read yours or I read mine. Yeah. Um, let's see. I have. Uh, I think Venus and Mars, right? Yeah, Venus, Mars, and Sun, Mercury. Okay, I have Jupiter, Moon, Mercury, Saturn. So okay, the first so one is moon. right there. Produces a wise and rich man, thank God, who establishes the good honor of his relatives, a courteous, a courteous person who is pleased by gods. Thank you, God. The twice born, that means I'm the second born? No, I think twice born is an epithet of... Oh, um, of, of, of somebody who is wise because he... Yeah. Okay, a teacher and teachers, a man of pure character and firm for Man, I get these very contradictory descriptions. I don't know if you've, you've seen that. Uh, what's yours? Uh, um, <clears throat> let's see, uh, Sun and Mercury? Yeah, there I it is. I have Sun Venus. I have Sun Venus. Oh, okay. Sun Venus produces a competent person who is clever in the science, science of, of swords and weapons. <laughs> A wrestler who is knowledgeable in great arenas. A man whose family is increased by living with a wife at the end of his life and whose vision is weak. Huh, why the heck would Venus give a competent person in swords? That's a hard one. I mean, sun is a shatria. Maybe Venus is the idea of the art, of the martial art, right? Maybe. Yeah. Which, I mean, which, which I guess would be more of a Mars-Venus combination, but yeah. Well, in, I mean, in Parashara, he gives uh, Venus. Um, he gives Venus associated with uh, Parasharama, which is the mm -hmm. avatar that you know is like a great warrior, and destroys all the these Brahman things. that became a Kshatriya. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's kind of interesting. Um, or it's a ruse. Who knows, right? It could be another ruse. Like think about, think twice before you just think you can read my text, guys. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Man and his and his ways. Yes. Yeah. Sun and Mercury produces a wise and noble person endowed with good. A noble, a noble, a noble yeah. man. Yeah, good qualities of speech. One who is proud of his strength and looks. A servant desiring glory, but having insecure wealth. I would say I have insecure wealth typically. One beloved among kings and good men. Again, this kings thing comes up for me a lot. I've known a lot of like famous, uh, sort of wealthy people. Well, you know, you know me, so yeah. I know you. Yeah, <laughs> I uh, a friend of mine has um, uh, has like royal lineage from Britain and from Barbados, for example. So, um, this is quite literally true in my life often, and I think it's interesting too because. We, you know, Yavana Jataka, I can't remember if it talks about combustion or not in chapter one. I, I just. He, he, he mentioned, we, we talked about that. He might mention it. Uh, right. Subliminally, but with yeah. With the solar yogas and with, a, there was another shloka we looked at where, yeah, where it sort of seemed to be implied. But what's interesting here is this seems to reaffirm uh, one of uh, kind of a popular 
opinion in Jyotish, not everyone agrees with it, but it's something like Bepin Bahari talks about that mercury is not really negatively affected by combustion. And Hart Defoe himself, uh, Hart Defoe and Robert Svoboda in Light on Life, a really great modern Jyotish classic. They talked about how combustion does not destroy the inner qualities of the planet. It just seems to obstruct its ability to manifest things in the world. So anyone with like a, a, a Venus sun conjunction, for example, can be like really artistic and like really Venusian, even if they have problems with Venusian things in life, they're still going to be innately like that. And I think we find the same things happening here uh, in Yavana Jataka. But like, it, it's interesting too, because like, if you look at the Saturn one, it's quite good. You know, it's not what we would really expect, but Saturn yeah. is getting purified, right? So a man of purified by virtues of his clan and adored with righteousness because of his acts. A wanderer who has lost his wife and sons, an expert in the use of minerals. So it's another one of those conundrums where Yavana Jataka inspires us to look a little more closely at some oh, of these things. You know? I just I just want to say that Sun Saturn conjunctions are very good. You know, and and I'm gonna explain why. You know? Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna explain why because that from the get go can be confusing. Obviously, they're worst enemies. Obviously, it's like the father and the son who hate each other. But I see Saturn and Swan conjunctions like in the movies when the bad guy and the good guy team up together to fight the even bigger guy, and they're very strong. So, oh, in a way, you get the king and the servant teaming up. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, to to unite and and to fight and to work or whatever they want to do. It, the thing is that the Saturn-Sun conjunctions create friction, create frustration. Definitely. Create a lot of difficulties. But if this is worked out, the combination is amazing. These are the combinations yeah. that create, you know, um, self-made men. Yes. Uh, people who are their own boss, people who are independent, people who are powerful. Right. Um, it's almost like the sun, again, is purifying yeah. the darkness of Saturn. And so that the friction that comes out of that can be very auspicious. And as this shloka implies, it's not without its great challenges. You know, losing yes. his wife and sons is pretty yes. heavy blow. It is difficult. But without yeah. yeah. But it's not quite as like hopeless as maybe some other texts later on make out. And we also... Especially, you know, especially in Jyotish, yeah. We also find, too, at the top here, the sun and moon is quite uh, negative, which makes sense because the the new moon and, you know, you can't see it. But I just wanted to briefly look at some of these other ones, too, real quick. You know, Jupiter in the sun is very strengthening. Um, twice born, all these really good things. We already looked at sun and Venus. And then uh, sun and Mars is, is – even sun and Mars is quite good, though, you know, lacking – knowledge or righteousness the person is generous and very courageous and strong and so it's kind of like uh yeah. kind of reminds me of yeah. kind of reminds fight. me of um sid caesar from show of shows I yeah know. i love sid caesar yeah like, yeah i really like yeah him. yeah well i'm in a play he's, he's, he's underrated by by our generation but he was he was very good yeah. yeah, he he was kind of like this Mars Sun kind of person, like really loud and raucous, but you know, and having a lot of drug problems, but very generous. Oh, really? Did loving it. Drug problems? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm actually I'm what, in a play. Co cocaine, cocaine. What a lot mean? of different things. I'm I'm in a really? play that's based oh. off of that. Yeah, that's based off that. So he lost a lot of weight at the end of his life. Yeah, did he? That's probably from. Yeah, from you see him when in the fifties. He was like you know built chubby and then when he's like in the 70s he's like thinner and yeah but we're yeah, not gonna yeah. talk about it and and you know james dean too i don't i don't think he had a mars sun conjunction but he might have had it opposite because i know mars was retrograde and you know james dean is kind of like this courageous martial person who doesn't have a lot of regard for social etiquette or necessarily doing the right thing according to the rules the standards of, yeah so anyway, <clears throat> um, hence yeah, so, a rebel without a cause. <laughs> hence a rebel without a cause. Yeah. Um, okay. I I have another one. Did you have another one? I forget. Yeah. Uh, Saturn Mercury. But you first got. We got to first read yours, right? Okay. Um, Mars and Venus. Yeah, it's kind of a wide conjunction, but <clears throat> nonetheless, it's there. A very sexual one. 
Yeah, Mars and Venus produce a man who seduces other men's wives. <clears throat> a fop who delights in dishonesty, lying and gambling. God. A wrestler or a soldier. A leader of cowherds. One who lives by fighting. Well, I've had my fair share of arguments. Um, and I, I have also done uh, martial arts in the past. Um, and a... Um, a fop who delights in dishonesty. Jesus. Well, I I do like to make fun of things in a way that is like where I'll I'll use humor. I'll be dishonest through my humor, but on purpose, you know. And usually most people can't handle it, so I add. I'm just kidding at the end. So may, maybe that uh, the seducing other men's wives thing is is kind of funny because. Um, I think I mentioned this in another video where I have had a lot of experiences like attracting women who are already in a relationship and then it's almost like uh after after our meeting or whatever which usually amounts to nothing more than like flirtatious conversation it's almost like the spell is broken yeah. when they like leave my that's my friends. that's your, your your charisma that comes from you being a leader of cow herds exactly <laughs> they, they just like my cows that i herd around so that's all it really is yeah all right, cool. Well, that was fun. Um, yeah, here's Saturn Mercury. Uh, here we go. Saturn and Mercury produces an atheist, not Nastika, a she and cheats, men who are struck by losses and whose friendships are unstable. So we have a very unstable friendship, Lars. Those oh, who know the meaning of minerals, alchemy, and of magic, workers in iron. Workers in You mean like iron. Uh, like a swordsmith or something like that? Yeah, working with iron in any capacity. No, I've never... I, I, I've kind of... I like the way the Japanese makes the katanas and... Oh, cool. And like medieval ironsmiths, like from, from like Nordic countries in Spain, but... No, I... I, I, I well, yeah, I guess that's more or less true, I guess, yeah. I'm yeah, not, and I think Mercury is kind of the karaha of friends, loosely yeah. speaking. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, yeah, I think so. I just say loosely because not everyone agrees. I've noticed, but I, I take him as friends, uh, and so yeah, that makes that makes sense from just a purely analytical perspective. Atheists make sense to me too. Um, Definitely. I mean, I don't think you're an atheist. Well, I'm not an atheist, but but, but I'm my my vision of the spiritual is very um, different to the majority of people. Yeah, I, I kind of have gotten that from you too. Like you're not an atheist in the no, way that no, modern okay. people think of I mean, atheism. But if you're, if you're, I'm sorry, but if you're smart, you can't be an atheist. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> I mean, I mean, there's there's no way around that one. I mean, but if you're, if you're, this, if you're any type of of intelligence, you can't be an atheist. Well, we we would need to look up this word. I've Nasty. seen it before. Um, it may have something to do with like um, a Buddhistic perspective or a, or a logical school of thought from ancient India that could be regarded as atheistic because Buddhism is arguably in, in most of its forms is arguably atheistic. Oh, definitely it is. Yeah. Because yeah, the, the way they conceptualize the Supreme being is not as a being, but as like a void shunyata that the emptiness or wholeness that pervades everything. And so it's very, um, in that sense, it's very impersonal. They emphasize a very impersonal sort of relationship to the divine, uh, and they I, don't think I, of it that way. So. I'm sorry, I have the definition here from Sanskrit. It oh, means cool. atheistical, atheist, unbeliever. Uh, it also has other meanings relating to anything lost, infidel, atheist, or unbeliever, owner oh, okay. of any lost object, free thinker, there we go. Free thinker, yeah. E, that's it. Yeah. That that makes sense because that that person would be called an atheist or something like that. A person who was willing to challenge the status quo of like, well, you know, these gods don't really exist necessarily the way you think they exist, or you know, whatever. Somebody who might have those kinds of very very Uranian, I might add. Yeah, very Uranian, definitely. And we're getting to Uranus pretty soon in the Almagadica. <laughs> <Yeah>. So <laughs> it's coming up. The hidden shulka. 
<laughs> yeah. The Indians knew about these, the, the, the Niranda Nasai, um, um, yeah. Was, uh, Nadi leaf. Yeah. Everybody that's story. Talks about that. Nobody really knows where the leaf is. Yeah. Right. That's, a, that's another topic for another video. Yeah, definitely. But you know, you can supposedly you can see Uranus with the naked eye during certain times of the year. Yeah. And, and that, ha I always compare Uranus to Mercury because oh, okay. Because he's hard Mercury, to see. Because it's it's vice versa, and no, in in an astro astronomical, they're very similar. Because you know everybody talks, oh Mercury, 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 but have you ever seen Mercury? <laughs> I uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. Mercury is very difficult to see with the bare eye, and and Uranus, it's like Uranus, Uranus, Uranus. Oh, you can never see Uranus. Have you experimented with that? You can see Uranus in right. some occasions. Just like Mercury, you can see it in some occasions. But the thing is that people think that Mercury, you can see it very easily. And Uranus, you think you can't see it at all. But that's just both are false in many ways. Yeah. So if you, and if you want to see a picture of it, you know, just type into Google Y-O-U-R and then space A-N-U-S yeah, yeah. and you'll see yeah. it. <laughs> and you're gonna see it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And oh. after, afterwards, you can look up the video, which is very good on Australia, called Two Girls and a Cup." Oh and, and, God! And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so no. yeah, you can just they talk about these things. Okay, <laughs> that's Saturn Mercury in the ascendant right there. Dirty, dirty humor for sure. Yeah. Catalonico, without a doubt. <laughs> okay, um, I wanted to look at these two shlokas real quick. Pretty simple. You started it, by the way. <laughs> I know I did, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, three planets in one sign produce each its own distinctive characteristics. This combination of three kinds of influence is to be known as one which is put together by their association with each other. So pretty complex mixing of influences when you've got three or more. Yeah, three in one sign. Um, and he's kind of glossing over it, so to speak, real quick. But then three benefic planets in one sign are said to cause the birth of men outstanding and rich in knowledge, glory, and wealth. So three malefic planets produce one who's afflicted by poverty and disease. This is gold, in my opinion, because what this is, is it's a way to, it's another way to assess the basis or the root of the nativity in a very broad manner. So, yes. what, so what that means is like we have earlier in the text, like we talked about in the last video where, or one of the other videos where, right, like multiple planets in their exaltations or own signs or even their own Vargas, right, is very, going to be very auspicious. It's going to give power to the, the nativity. So too, if you've got three benefic planets in one sign, it can give that same kind of power. And of course, these are very general, broad indications that need to be checked against, um, you know, more in-depth analysis, right? You got to see um, what else is going on if other things show this. But I really love stuff like this personally because I like those broad strokes and then you can get more detailed, you know? You know, uh, one, one difference, when we deal with conjunctions, I've noticed that there's a difference in the way Jyotish deals with them and the way um, Hellenistic astrology deals with them. Okay. Uh, I, 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 I don't, you know, for me, the perfect chart is the chart where, where every planet is in one sign and then is alone. Uh, even mm. the moon, but in good dignity and being hemmed by benefits is, is, is good, right? But, yeah. you know, the, the, you got to give space to the planets and conjunctions can be sometimes, they, they create a competition among those grahas in the house and everyone is trying to accomplish different agendas from the same place. And that's sometimes difficult. It's like three people in a kitchen trying to bake something. It's like everybody wants to do different things and there's got to be a leader. And, and you know, that, that creates a process by which the Yataka has to come into contact with these energies and bring them together, bridge them together, be diplomatic about them and, and make them work. And, and that takes time and, and, and effort. But, you know, uh, three benefits is okay. Uh, I, I really like this one because he says three malefics, but there are only two, <laughs> if you really think about it. Uh, oh. although, although he considers the the sun a malefic, although and the he, waning moon, Mercury, a, yeah, Mercury definitely. would become by extension. So if you had Saturn, yeah. Mars, and Mercury together in a sign, you would have yeah. three malefics. Uh, so he's so taking on. into consideration the Yotish 
rules, not necessarily. Uh, oh, it's like that in Hellenistic as well. It's the same exact thing. Okay, but the the waning moon is not is not considered yeah. a malefic malefic per se, right? Or no, it's it? considered. Oh, it's considered a. It's considered a malefic, temporal malefic, not okay. necessarily fundamentally malefic, but um, there are additional rules too in Hellenistic that have to do with waxing and waning moon and what planets it's aspecting, but that's for another but, video. I mean, three malefics would not necessarily create poverty in the seas. That's not... Okay, well, I'll, I'll give an example. I actually, I actually can think of a chart. Um, H.P. Blavatsky had uh, Mars, Saturn, and Mercury in Virgo. Oh, so wow. Mercury was in quite good condition, which was nice, which, you know, mitigated some of that. But um, if we if we think about her life, she had constant battles with enemies. She battled with her family. She was slandered heavily. She traveled all over the world. She almost died multiple times in like various situations, so one involving warfare, one, you know, others involving just have, being impoverished and kind of lost. She in, had in uh, Italy, right? She fought in the war. Yeah, in, in Italy. <laughs> she um and she, she was a, a revolutionary. <laughs> even though she came from a noble aristocratic family, she she basically left most of that behind and and suffered a lot of poverty and trials and tribulations. But she because, also because they made her marry a man he she didn't love. That's part of it, which she left him early on. That's where her last name comes from. But she actually had three planets, two, one in exaltation and two in their own sign. So she also had a basis for uh, greatness just from that there. Um, but, you know, it's a very good example of this technique. Uh, it seems to be quite perfect, um, actually. But I, I'm struggling to think of somebody who had three benefic planets together, I mean, like Jupiter, Venus, and Mercury or something would do it, you know? I mean... Three, three malefics, what they can produce is like somebody who's not very, who, 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 whom people don't find uh, agreeable or somebody who is, uh, uh, you know, that, that does not fit in, that somebody that other people dislike. Yeah. Yep. Uh, in the third, they can be highly beneficial because they create a positive argola in terms of, you know, being brave, being... That's true. Blavatsky has him in the third, actually. Oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah. And so, and Blavatsky yeah. traveled like for 20 years before she got settled in, in New York. And and then yeah. she got, then she went to India and then she went to it. Britain. Yeah. And then and then she died there. Right. Um, in Britain. Yeah. 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 Uh, but yeah, I mean, this, this kind of makes sense. Yeah. I mean, we always have to treat each chart differently. So, yeah. I, I just wanted to say something. Oh, no, we're going to chapter 22. No, I just wanted to say something no, ahead, about yeah. chapter 20 and 21. And this we've already discussed in other videos. No mention of the nodes. No mention of the nodes, yeah. At all. And another thing that we haven't discussed, which is, you know, it's, uh, these are always the odd oddballs in Yotish. No upagrahas anywhere. <laughs> oh, yeah, no upagrahas. That's true. And they 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 appear um, prominently in Parashara, but here I mean they don't exist. And yeah. the nodes are which 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 comes to the attention of did they even know that they existed? I mean the nodes, did they even know that it's yeah, it's it's hard to say because you know you do find the nodes in Hellenistic astrology uh, a decent amount. Early not, on, right? Yeah, right. Not, not to the extent that Indian astrology developed them and used them later on. Uh, not to that quite advanced of an extent, but you do find them quite a bit. And um, they knew about them. So, yeah, where, where the heck do the notes come from? Um, not really sure. Maybe Babylonian astrology. It's possible that they originated there. But I, I really don't know who was the first to, like, calculate them and say these are important. Pay attention to these. And why doesn't Yavana Jataka have them at all? It is a great mystery. And notes are very interesting. I, I, notes, in a way, remind me to the perfect, perfect, perfect uh, pro, procession of the equinoxes in terms of that it's a very complex astronomical... Well, it's not very complex, but it's complex astronomical calculation. It is, uh, yeah. I, I would like to know who discovered the notes do you know it's astronomically i know i know we know that that the procession was discovered by Hipparchus, but do we know who discovered the notes do we know who discovered the idea of 
of them existing and being instrumental in predicting eclipses? I mean, do we know that historically, like a, a point in history where they came? Well, I could be wrong, but I actually, I actually remember vaguely something from one of the ancient Vedas, maybe Artharva or one of the other ones, uh, talking about the sun being with Rahu, but it's not... It's not astrology as we understand it today. It's more like, it's more like omenology or something mm. like that. But I, I can't remember if that that's, was... That's the idea that Rahu were eclipses per se. Yeah, maybe that was, and it. Ketu, that was it. And Ketu was like comets and this sort of... Very possibly. stars or... Yeah, yeah. Because that's, that's how I... I've learned that Ketu and Rahu came into being in terms of astronomical analysis is that Rahu were specifically eclipses, lunar and solar. Yeah, it has and to come out of eclipses, knowledge of how e when and how eclipses would yeah. form. And so I mean, obviously it's very ancient. I would like to know that. But yeah, there's no mention of, of nodes, uh, no mention of Upakarahas, no mention of nakshatras either. Which is very little. Well, no, we, there's we, in the very beginning saw, and at the very yeah, end. Yeah, we just saw that one in chapter yeah, one. Yeah, just so. tiny. So far, nothing else. He talks about the visual charts, but no mention of nakshatra so far. Yeah. So okay. we move on to chapter 22, which is a confusing chapter for me. I kind of don't uh, really... Um, it's a short one, but I mean, uh, what we're seeing here is that... Well, he starts off with, with this shloka, which in a way it's, in my opinion, a little confusing, especially if you don't know Sanskrit, which would be... Uh, the the first shloka can you can you one should know that when four planets are in one sign there are born those who are banished uh, banished nirakra uh, or who renounce the word prabrajita ahidikas and men who abandon their homes or are <laughs> Ash ashrams, ashrams exactly. people who yeah, live yeah. in ashrams. Yeah, and those who attain the perfection of beatitude. Beatitude, that's, that's sanctity. That's like being a saint. Okay. Yeah, not but, nashreya. I don't know what that means. <laughs> but then he moves on and say, as many are the strong planets in this yoga. So now he's yeah. talking about yoga of the four planets. Yeah. So many are the natives' rights, diksha, and the right is the first time which is determined by the strongest planet or by the uh planet which has the strength of yeah, dasha yoga. or yoga yeah. meaning dasha like if it comes up in the dasha yeah. as the ruler oh, i'm sorry um, was this a chapter about the master of the nativity or was the next one well it's it's in here a little bit yeah okay. it's, it's in here a little bit um and so this this is uh this is where we get like in in parashara chapter Oh, I bookmarked it and I lost it. Uh, chapter 79, I think. Which would be the Sanyasa Yogas, right? Yeah, and it's the same, it's the same idea. Um, maybe arguably a little bit changed. Which is the idea of having a lot of planets in one house, which is kind of what we've discussed just now uh, briefly. Yeah, and, and I mean, this really, this really does work in my limited experience of seeing it in a couple charts of people who were sannyasis of some kind like osho is a good example oh yes He's got four planets in capricorn and um one is mars and one is uh saturn and uh the mars refers to um in one of these texts here it probably in parasha which i have um mars actually makes a person who is um following of sect of Buddhism that wears red, actually. Uh, yeah, Ashakya is an ascetic of the Buddhist clan, and Mars refers to Ash Ashakya in Parashara's text. So, um, so, and there's also some connotation in here of, of Mars and wearing red. And Osho, though I'm not a huge fan of him, he's a good example because he did wear I really like the, doc the Netflix documentary is excellent. Oh yeah, it's great, it's excellent. Excellent, um, excellent. Wild, wild country. Definitely yeah. check that and out, Ma folks. Anand Chila, what a character. But yeah, all his followers wore this same red, and he wore it for much of his life, and he espoused kind of a pseudo-Buddhistic yep. 
philosophy. Very pseudo. <laughs> yeah, very pseudo. And the initiations were of a sexual nature and and right. the group um, per se was very aphrodisiac, to say the least. Yes, but he, he would have he would have two planets as Yavana Jataka is hinting at that are strong in that yoga of four planets in a sign, right? So theoretically this may be why he eventually like changed his approach toward the end of his life. Uh, he he shifted and you know he started calling himself Osho instead of Rajneesh and he stopped wearing the red robes and he kind of changed his message a little bit or whatever. He, he probably did it more than once, but you know, it kind of, uh, we can see that, uh, these yogas, uh, at least seem to work in the life and chart of Osho. But, um, I think most people that have four planets in a sign don't become sannyasis, at least in the West, because it's not a cultural thing. They sort of end yeah. up being kind of, um, a bit crazy. Or a yeah. Bit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, th the idea is that when you have a lot of planets in one house, you're going to have problems, right? And the idea is, if you're going to have problems in the real world, then renounce it and become a Sanjasi, like become a yeah. Sanjasi, which makes sense, right? And and it, it's complicated because you sometimes get these conjunctions of a lot of planets and they say they're good, but really in the real world context, they're kind of bad. So that's why you got to renounce yourself and go to the spiritual world. Um, these are what modern astrologers called stelliums yeah right and uh i've seen that the description of stelliums when four planets come together uh they say you know you just mix the energies and that's what you get but it's more complicated yes. than that. And it is. you you know planets are persons and if you lock four people in one room and they're there forever you're going to have a lot of difficulty all throughout your life and you have to deal with these difficulties and they create friction they create uh even traumas they they can create situations where you gotta figure out how to mix these energies together it's not as simple as bake, baking a cake for example right it's it you gotta mix them together and that's the idea it's mean that there are a lot of planets competing with each other in the same place to accomplish each one's planetary agendas. So there's some people who are going to be left out. Not a lot of energy is going to use in all the agendas. Some people are going to get more energy than others. And you get these. And, and I mean, Javana Yadaka here is a little bit confusing because he gives good results. But I think he... Yeah. Well, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he doesn't really explain what I'm saying. That the no, not really. Be, I mean, Osho. I mean, look at his life. I mean, the guy was a guru. Yeah. And not everybody's a guru. I mean, and a lot of people have four planets conjunctions. Not a lot, but a lot of people do. Uh, and you know, there's another. Uh, there's another in Brihadjataka. You have the same thing about discussing sanjas, sanjasa yogas in chapter uh, 15 of of Bibi Raman's father's version okay. uh, and he talks about these and he talks about which planet is the strongest just like Yavanayataka does and also in Garga Hora which is another classic where they discuss the conjunctions and you see that the conjunctions with a lot of planets are usually negative but huh. in the context of the real world which is what I believe right um Conjunctions yeah. of this nature are not easy. That's just what yeah, I want to say. Not easy. And yeah. that idea is not uh, convey in this shiloka, in in this chapter. No, it's it's not really. And I also want to point out too. There's an earlier chapter where he gives different yogas for asceticism, and so it's important to remember too that this isn't the only. These aren't the only conditions for. Uh, somebody becoming a religious monk or ascetic or something. There are other conditions and there are, you know, several uh, saints I can think of where they don't have this. They have something else that signifies it. But these are, these are fun to read. I really just like these, like Jupiter produces a sannyasin who has obtained righteousness and is wise in knowledge. Venus, a leader of Characas, which is a, um, that's Is the capital a... of that's the capital of Venezuela. <laughs> <laughs> it's this book the Parashras, the notes in Parashras say a Charaka is a religious mendicant wandering over many countries. Um, but who is uh P 
disappear and gains fame by knowing painting and transcribing and sacred mm. traditions. Arts, right there. Yeah. yeah. Moon a shravaka with the merit of an elder. I forget what this means. I, I, I looked look these up and forgot. <laughs> I can look it up. The sun, a chief of ascetics. That makes sense, right? Sun is the king. Mars, a sakya shramana, which is a, again, sakya clan is a Buddhistic, was a Buddhistic philosophy that I guess was popular in India at the time. Uh, with a bad character. <laughs> Shravaka uh, is a disciple, a pupil. Ah, okay. Shravaka is a, a disciple. Okay. So you have moon, disciple, sun as leader. That's uh, Saturn and naked Upashaka, which makes sense. Uh, somebody who's, you know, given up everything and they just start naked and wander around. Mercury having having one linga i don't know what that means uh, linga like a shiva linga it means maybe like, yeah like that's like a penis if i'm not mistaken. yeah but i i love this a mutterer who understands the meanings of his mutterings <laughs> <laughs> an active person so like somebody who who looks like a crazy person yeah, think, yeah. <laughs> so that would be like maybe like an Andy Kaufman type of person. Totally right. Yeah, yeah, it's great. So I just I love that. And again, you find this this same idea repeated in other texts, especially Parashara. It might be slightly different in Parashara, um, but it's the same general idea. So, but then he goes on and talks about even if a planet in the sixth and seventh, even if a planet is weak and little strength. If it is in the house of a friend, a native of the devotee of uh, Vaktivan, and that planet's deity, however, if it is overcome by another or in the health of an enemy, it causes the birth of a heretic. A heretic, yeah. Yeah, and then he talks about the Lord of the Nativity. If the Lord of the Nativity is weak, overcome by others, and aspected by a strong Saturn, but not by a friend or by benefic planets, then it doubtless causes the birth of a Dikshika. So he's, he's starting to mix a lot of things that um, we haven't discussed the Lord of the... This is the first time he mentioned the Lord of the Nativity in the whole book, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. He doesn't say how to... how to, And that's a, a topic of debate, right? How to obtain the, the Lord of the Nativity. Um, yeah, and, in Hellenistic astrology, yeah. there's like a whole... There's different ways. I mean, when I read it, I just thought he meant the Ascendant Lord. Uh, but I don't know, because he doesn't... You know, we... We have all these terms and we don't yeah, know. Yeah, um, maybe. And, but, he, you know. and he, he doesn't discuss how to... Another thing that's confusing about the Shiloka is that he doesn't talk about which planet, how to, to figure out the strongest planet in the conjunction. Oh, well, I think he's sort of implying, or we, I would just assume we take things into account like dignity and directional strength and the other the other balas he gives at the beginning, which are, you know, some of pieces of Shadbala, um, sect, stuff like that. So just by the usual sort of rules for determining strength, you know, like obviously an exalted Mars amongst four planets is going to be the strongest, like in Osho's situation, you know, just because it's exalted. So, yeah, that's the thing. It was the Ascendant Lord, not the Lord. And, uh, well, it, it, could, it could be, but more than likely, yeah, it's just the Ascendant Lord. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, it's the Ascendant Lord. Yeah, I'm a fool. Yeah, continue. <laughs> uh, you know, Johnny Carson also had Saturn Mercury rising. In the Lagna? Oh, nice, yeah. but I have Uranus, so I'm never going to work for <laughs> the, the Hollywood Jews. So, yeah, let's continue. Okay. Um, yeah. And then we have more Lord of the Nativity stuff here, but it's, it's, these yogas are really interesting because of like, you know, Lord of Nativity weak and then Saturn really strong in some way with the waning moon. And then that person's going to be some sort of renunciate. It makes sense. Yeah. But it's like, you're, you're almost looking for a weakness or affliction in the chart instead of looking for like strength and yeah. glory. So but you okay, know, people yeah. have to, 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 to know what we've just discussed. You know, a lot of planets yeah. in one house, it's tricky. It's uh, challenging. Yeah. yeah. Too many cooks in the kitchen. Yeah. If you have that, you know, consider going to an ashram or, or becoming a, a yogi. Of, or, I mean, not a yogi, a sort of a, a initiate. Or just become a mutterer who understands his own mutterings. Of course. <laughs> Which I think applies to both of us in many ways. Yeah. Do you All understand right. your own mutterings, uh, uh, Lars? 
Yeah, I do. I also <laughs> understand how stupid they are. <laughs> Jesus. A, a moment there. Chapter 23 and 24 are uh, chapters that are more or less incomplete. Yeah. So we're going to see some blank spaces. So do you want to continue? Yeah, just, but I just want to mention what this is, right? It's uh, five or more planets in one sign. And then unfortunately, it's incomplete, as you can see here. And then down, the, down in the shlokas, we sort of get, we sort of get some like interesting things of like, it, it appears to be like Venus and other planets coming together. But what I find really fascinating is how he talks about the Drekinas. He just mentions them all of a sudden right here, right in seven and then in nine. Um, so in a Varga of Mercury, one who is famous with respect to works involving the things pertaining to the Drekinas of the various planets. So whatever this yoga is like, it, and it may just be like Venus in a Varga of Mercury. Um, he wants you to take certain significations from the Drekina, this, the image of the Drekina and the description that he gives later that we haven't gotten to of the Drekina. And then same thing here, right? Like, such are the influence of these planets on crafts with regard to the Drekinas. So obviously, on some level, he wants us to use Drekinas to describe like crafts and work and kind of like the types of things that are created when, when we're looking at the planets for I don't, well, I don't even know what, what the heck is this yeah. chapter? It's like five planets. And, 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 then... and it started in chapter 22. I mean, these, and, and not, not only that, he also gives good descriptions for these conjunctions while in other books, especially a uh, uh, Garga Hora, you get really negative results for these conjunctions because there are a lot of planets uh, all in the same place. Yeah. Why is, why is five planets here producing such great results all of a sudden. And then I think later on, I think later on, I remember reading, he talks about, you know, he starts to do the yogas of like all planets in one sign, all planets in two signs. But actually, you know, we have that contradiction in modern Jyotish as well. Like if I'm not mistaken, um, oh no, no, no. Yeah, no, it's, it's not a contradiction. Sorry. It's a contradiction here because or is it? No, I'm sorry. I'm confusing myself. It's Don't not worry. A contra- Take your time. Take your time. What I'm trying to say is that later he talks about the yogas of if you have like all the planets in one sign, all of them in two signs, all of them in three signs. And those are particularly negative until you get to like all planets in four, five, six, and seven. You know, one through three are particularly difficult. So, but five planets in one sign would be all planets in two signs, exactly. right? Exactly. Or two or three signs. So that would be that would be difficult according to that yoga. So yeah, it kind of is a contradiction, but yeah, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> and and you know, a lot of a lot of shlokas are missing here. So you know, that kind of gives you an idea of maybe this is weird. I mean, well, yeah, there's an an implicit weirdness to these parts that you know, and and there are a lot of interrogation signs, and I mean, I don't know. If you well, want to continue to the next yeah, one. there you have it in the Yavana Jataka configurations with respects to crafts. Okay, <laughs> glad we cleared that up. Chapter, Chapter 24, 24, once again, the same shloka thing. Shloka one, dot, dot, dot. Uh, we're missing some shlokas, but it was clearly supposed to be about conjunctions of six planets and what that produces. And then he The launched... knowledge was too big to, to exactly. To be yeah. Yeah, those he, are the shlokas for the the missing trans Saturnian planets. We just don't. Yeah, know. exactly. That, that's them. <laughs> then he jumps into seven planets in one sign, and as you can see, this is really, really difficult. Really, pretty negative for the most part. Um, you know, sun creates unrighteousness. Mars, you know, kind of just something mediocrely Martian. Uh, Saturn a drunkard, and so on and so forth. Um, even Jupiter, a timid fool or one who has given up. Um, and, you know, just generally the first sloka here that we have, number four, in one, seven planets in one sign causes the birth of evil men who are afflicted by disease and miseries, have little wealth, short-lived, and so on. And I just want to say this happened in February 1962. Well, you know what's funny? There's an actress who has, I think, all seven planets in one sign, or at least maybe it's like six in one. And uh, I think she was in, um, I think it's, it's this, this actress who was in that, that movie Hateful Eight by Quentin Tarantino. 
I'm pretty sure she's the one who plays the the woman who's been like. I did. I didn't see Hateful Eight. The one well, that anyway. plays the guitar. No, she has to be older. No, no, no. The one who who's like captured. She's like a criminal, and she's being well, taken know. to be hung. Anyway, this actress. I remember looking at her chart had had something like this, and it's like. Uh, even this is apparently not the end of the world, you know. You can no, st- no. And and them. I just wanted to say that the the biggest stellium that I know of happened in February 1962. She might have been. Wait, and what sign was it in? Uh, Aquarius. Yeah, that's in it. The, in the in the tropical chart. That's and it. That's a very impressive stellium. So you know, if you want to test this, you got to look for people who were born in February 1962. I believe it was the 14th or 15th anyway you can look it up in your in your software it's That's a the fascinating chart. it's a fascinating arrangement of planets and and you know i've always I, i've always thought that 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 had had to do some that has to have some significance in terms of, of maybe the ages in terms of how how like that doesn't happen a, a, a very often when you get all the yeah. planets i mean all the planets the only thing that wasn't there was like uh one of the nodes obviously Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I don't think these yogas uh, ever deal with the nodes. No, but I mean, right? in this stellium, everything was there. I mean, even the oh, moon, wow. every, everything, and and, wow. and actually, we're gonna get that grand conjunction again in 2021 at the beginning of 2021 of Saturn and and Jupiter. Uh, oh wow! Again in Aquarius, but I wow. Mean, a, was it Capricorn? I think it was Capricorn or, or Aquarius. I'm not well, sure. I remember Aquarius from this woman's chart. And it so was maybe exactly it's Aquarius. Like yeah. Chart. But I, I've always found that arrangement fascinating. And that was, uh, historically, that was very close to the Cuban Missile Crisis. So, which oh, wow. was like the closest we've gotten to a third world war of nuclear proportions. Wow. Yeah, uh, that's true. But... Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that. And he does mention in this uh, arrangement at last that, that these are uh, negative uh, uh, arrangements, right? You know, a pauper uh, uh, or an unrighteous man, you know, uh, he, he, he kind of falls into the uh, acceptable Jyotish knowledge of today, I guess. Yeah. Chapter 25? So chapter 25 is the planets in the remaining three angles. So we've already seen the ascendant in chapter, like, what was it? Chapter 19. 19, 19, yeah. Um, And, uh, and so then, yeah, we have, um, we have this, uh, the, the planets in the remaining angles, which is really important because as we'll see later, Yavana Jataka um, kind of follows the Hellenistic tradition in this respect that, Planets in angles can be significators of the person's thoughts and actions. Definitely. So if, especially if a person has nothing in the ascendant, you know, you, you will see what other angles they have filled. Like I only have one planet in an angle in the seventh house. So that would be easy for me. That's what I look to for this kind of significator of thoughts and actions. But, um, so, uh, let's. What planet do you have in the seventh? Uh, the moon. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's me. Cool. So I don't, I don't have any, I don't really have any of these except the moon. Yeah. So do you, what do you have? I don't have anything. I just have planets in, in Lagna. I don't have anything in the fourth, seventh. Okay. Planet. And remember though, it's also from the moon here. So we get Chandra. Oh, Lagna from the moon. I got a lot. Yeah. yeah. From the moon I have, okay. yeah, I have Venus sun in the 10th. Okay. Well, when we get to that, we'll take a yeah. look if you want. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm a, I'll do I'll do mine in the in the seventh I Where's guess. Where's the moon? I don't see it. I think it's on the next page. Um, you better have it there. Oh, I don't see it. Weird. There you go. Ah oh, no, mid heaven. No. Uh, no, nobody cares about the moon. Did I miss it? I think we did. Jupiter, Venus. Oh, the moon. Yeah, it's early on. Sorry. Uh, okay. The moon, a man whose body is distressed by poverty and disease, or whose wife is feeble because of wounds and illnesses. <laughs> great, great. Which makes sense because it's the seventh house. So, yeah. I mean, I have been distressed by the notion of poverty. I've been fortunate to never be who hasn't? I in mean, poverty, who hasn't? but I, I have suffered bodily um, 
bodily pains because of stressing out over poverty, which I've ironically never really had. So, um, but I've never been married. So I'm just going to gloss over that. Uh, (laughs) My moon's pretty malefic too. So that doesn't help, but um, okay. So you wanted to look at, uh, you had Uh, something in the 10th, right? From the moon. Venus sun in the 10th from moon. Yes. Okay, so Venus. Here's Venus in the tenth. Crosses an increase in such thing as cattle, fields, and plow lands, and is beneficial with respect to actions pertaining to women, wares, and houses. It gives immense treasures and security, honor in one's family, and the murder of one's enemies among women. <laughs> wow. Well, that's wow. all pretty empowering stuff. And then you yeah. had sun, right? But it's from the moon, so it's in my head only. So uh, he is successful in actions involving fire, herbs, oil, sticks, serving the kings, and guarding cattle. His grief has disappeared, and his work is outstanding. He obtains praise. I must add that I also have Ketu there. Right, so, right, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, these don't, do not, uh, these do not feel like they're me <laughs> in a way. Contrary to the others, I, I have to say that the, the, the others kind of had more of a, of they 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 had more of a ring to me. But these, no, no, I but, mean, you know, was there. You, you've probably experienced this too. Like we we tend to these days we do tend to think of Chandra Lagna as like okay, this is what's in the person's head or whatever. But man, I've read charts from Chandra Lagna when I didn't have anything else, and the results were really accurate for their yeah, life. I mean, really accurate. Well, yeah, but that's that's but that's so, the serendipitous aspect of astrology. That's that's the idea that you have to have that in that moment to give that reading, and that's why it turned out perfectly. You know what I mean? Yeah, but you know, o- older Jodishis just they, use the moon. They use both. They read from both, yeah. and um, I mean, my experience is that you know, like uh, what's you know, it's part of it is like what's in our head is also what's oh, definitely. manifesting our life, without and that's, a doubt. Without and that's a why doubt. it works. That's really why it works so well. But so. I kind of seen that when the contradictions between Chandra Lagna and the Lagna are big, you don't get that. There has to be that a makes sense. synchronicity between them. Yeah, there sh- there should and be. In my chart, it's th- that's what happens. <laughs> is it? Yeah, you see my chart from Chandra Lagna, and I should be a king. You see my chart from Lagna, and I am I'm, I'm a pauper in many ways. So you know, I get I guess you get a mixture of both in my life, which I think makes sense. And obviously, nobody knows my chart as I know it because yeah. That's well, and, and we we still don't know we still don't know your future necessarily. Oh, okay. We yeah. you know you've got plenty of time to become a king. <laughs> oh, definitely. No, I am a king. See, I'm the king. It's right here. <laughs> You're the king. All right. But yeah, yeah. I mean, and and this is something that that most Yotishis astrologers fail to realize. You also have to see it from Chandra Lagna. You have to see the chart from Chandra Lagna. Yeah. And that's something that that's something that I've noticed that modern people our age do not emphasize a lot in comparison to people to older astrologers. Yeah, man. And I got to say, reading it from um, the lot of fortune, which the Hellenistics do, which is hardcore. That's another ascendant of the moon. It tends to work really, really well. Um, Where's where's your lot of fortune? It's in Leo. um, And like my. uh, Mine is in Pisces. Okay. Yeah, my my, the Lord of it ends up being in um, the ninth from fortune. You know, so that really, when I saw that, that really explained my like obsession with religions and wisdom traditions a lot better than my chart by itself does. Because my chart by itself, those same, those two planets, Ascendant Lord and Sun, sorry, Ascendant Lord and Lord of the Lot of Fortune fall in the eighth. And um, I mean, I like hated religion growing up and stuff for the <laughs> most part. And then I at just, a certain I point, I didn't, I didn't hate it, but I, I was uh, apathetic towards it. Yeah, and then this seeing this like ninth placement, I was like, oh my god, that really, that explains it like simply and succinctly, and I don't even have to, 
jump over hoops and barrels to justify it. But anyway, mine, mine is in the fourth, and I might add that I've always had a like my mother son relationships have always been uh, unorthodox, uh, heterodox for that matter. And also, also uh, some friction with, with the place I come from, my country, that's also there. So, and in a big way in terms of how I am formed. So yeah, I, I can relate mm -hmm. to that. I'm sorry, Lars, I need to take a potty break. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, while Fernando does that, um, I will, um, I want to talk about these shlokas, but I also want to wait for him to get back. So I'll just read them out loud real quick. Even if a planet is in the 10th place, the actions of men are in vain if they do not make an effort. The description of different actions which arises from the natures of the planets holds good both in the sign in the 10th place and in that sign's navamshas. The malepic planets in their own houses or navamshas and aspected by or in conjunction with malefic planets become the friends of these because of a temporary reversal of the good and bad influences indicated previously. So I was just reading these two slokas for people because they're very, they're very interesting. Um, 16 implies that basically you know, the 10th Will, place willpower, yeah, right? is not set in stone. Like you could have a great 10th house, but if you're not, if you're not um, taking advantage of it, if you're just being lazy and that sort of a thing. And so there's like a free will component here. And then I saw this, I saw this in a chart once of a girl who had like three planets in the 10th in good dignity, mm -hmm. nothing. And she, she always got with uh she had a, a, a she had a Venus that was in bad dignity, and the, and the seventh was in a bad condition. So I mean, she was also always held back by by boyfriends that didn't help her. But she had I mean her her dashas have not wow. come up, but like very strong tenth house. But if this makes complete sense, I mean, and this yeah. is something that that clients usually do not understand. Some clients come to you and say, "When I'm going to do this? When I'm going to do that?" And you tell them. And they, they think things are just going to happen, but specifically yeah. with things in the 10th, you got to take the proper initiative to make things happen. Yeah. It's the, it's the karma bhava, the action Definitely. place. So, um, so it rules over our actions. And then the, the signs too, you can apply the planet's meaning to the sign or vice versa, right? So you want to look at the sign, especially if you have no planets in the 10th, like myself, I would look at, Gemini, Mercury, and so on. And then this this part is interesting though, right? Holds good both in the sign and in that sign's navamshas. So I don't know what the hell that means. Is that me neither? I, I really don't get that. You know, it's it's very strange, but maybe what it's saying is that you want to look at the planet's placement in the navamshas when they're in the tenth, or you want to look and see if you're using the midheaven like I use sometimes right you might want to see what navamsha the midheaven is in it could be something like that so but we don't know but then uh this next shloka 17 is really odd because it's almost saying that like if malefic planets have good dignity but then are aspected by other malefic planets they sort of temporarily become friends for matters pertaining to the 10th house i don't get that at all i think that has to do with the idea of can canceling oh, each other out or or overcoming or the idea of just because the 10th is like the top so it's you just have the power to to do things and step over others i don't know i i'm just yeah step on other people's faces yeah. and things like that yeah for 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 your own personal greatness yeah i don't know i don't know it's like like malefics want to be big, want to be powerful. Malefics are egotistical; they keep the good. So you know, if a malefic sees another malefic, it's I want that too, so I'm going to help you. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. All right, cool. Well, let's go to um shloka twenty because I just wanted to. I noted sure. that down as well. Nineteen is interesting too. If Sun, Mars, or Saturn is in the tenth and has qualities which are highest, middling, or lowest, I guess dignity, then there appears action which is respectively highest, middling, or lowest. If the benefic planets are thus the opposite is true, 
again, I'm not really. I don't understand that. I, I, I almost wonder if it's suggesting that Sun, Mars, and Saturn are going to be like more likely to stir the person to action than the benefics. I don't know. It's, it's really. Uh, but the thing is, what are qualities which are highest, middling, or lowest? Does he refer to, to dignity or? I wonder if it's like the, the quadruple graha or maybe yoga. Like something with the faces, with the draconas? I don't know. I don't know, but in, in 20, speaking of Drekanas, we get the Drekanas again. Yeah. Um, if the planets in the 10th place are in the signs of their dejections or in the Navamshas of those signs or in the houses or Navamshas as their enemies, they produce a slave. Yeah. The planet in the 10th place or its Navamsha is the giver of the acquisition of wealth. That's interesting as well. By your actions, so you will attain. Or else the Lord of the Drekana determines men's profession. So the Lord of the Drekana of what? The Midheaven? Yeah. Right? Or something like that. It's it's gonna be again, we have this theme of Drekinas coming back in. Uh, Drekinas kind of popping up here and there in the book in kind of odd, odd ways. But clearly the Drekina is to be used to help us describe the person's actions or profession for whatever reason. It's weird because I have Saturn in the tenth in Navamcha, but it's debilitated. No, no, no. This means in the tenth place of the Rashi chart, and then if no, the but planet, the the one the planet in the tenth place or it's Navamsha. Yeah, yeah. The planet planets in the tenth place in the signs of their dejections or in the Navamshas of those signs. So uh, that would be like sorry. Yeah, yeah. Because Yavana Jataka doesn't make a new chart from divisionals from what I can tell. So if you had a planet in the 10th and it happened to be also in its Novamsha of like the, it, uh, where it falls, right? Like uh, Mars in the 10th in, uh, you know, uh, the Novamsha of Cancer. Oh, okay. But maybe it's in the sign of Taurus, but in the Novamsha of Cancer, let's say, then that's what it's talking about. Okay. Um, okay, and then I, I liked some of these uh, shlokas down here too. These are really, I think, little gems. Um, basic stuff about actions, um, kind of overviewed. The sun causes a native to earn money by selling goods in foreign lands. The moon. This is this is by being in the tenth in Rashi chart, correct? I think so. Yeah, this is, but this is specifically related to like a profession now, because. Okay. Um, it just talked about, you know, kind of acquisition of wealth in the previous shloka. So the sun, by selling goods in foreign lands, and this is interesting because while Jaimini gives the sun influence on spouse as somebody close by, there's actually, um, in one of the Persian texts, there's a statement that the sun influencing religion can mean a foreign religion. So sometimes the sun is things near, sometimes it's things far. <laughs> Um, but I love this. The moon gives an innate profession. So almost like a, a talent or something. Don't something you that you feel familiar with. Yeah. That comes innately to you. Like yeah. you have talent for it. Yeah. I thought that was cool. And then Jupiter, a fearless guardian or petitioner, Mercury, I speak is, yeah. Uh, a, a zealot. Yeah. The Jupiter one. Yeah. yeah. Mercury by speeches and that do not offend against good conduct. Um, Venus who disobeys orders or who solicits for women. <laughs> who disobeys orders or solicits for women. A feminist. A feminist, yeah. Mars, one who is dragged down by force of soldiers and Saturn, one who is struck by unending sorrows. Inclinations towards these professions occur in the periods, the shahs of the planets, belonging to the planets in the 10th place. And or then, perfections for that matter, maybe. Yeah, yeah any, any sort of time lord, sure. Um, and then, yeah, the bene benefics, you know, well-placed um, accomplishment of work achieved by oneself. In their exaltations, they cause an absence of obstacles and the malefic planets endow men with a loss of increase and profit in such situations. So very useful insights where the benefics are going to give, you know, uh, just success in the work. But in their exaltations, it's almost like it just comes to you without as much work. And then malefics just show profit in uh, extenuating circumstances. Excellent. 
All right, cool. We're down to the last chapter for today. I'm, uh, I'm getting winded. So it's, it's yeah, cool. let's go over it really fast. I mean, it's the same <sighs> as we did just now, but it's the second, the third, the fifth, the sixth, the eighth, the ninth and the 11th house. Right. So all the, and, uh, and I guess the 12th, right? And the 12th, I'm sorry. Yeah, yes. So all the, all the remaining houses outside of the angles, uh, and the apoclimas and the panafaras pretty yeah pretty straightforward so did you want to um did you want to do really i mean do you want to do yours um yeah i'll, I'll do a couple sure um i'll go to uh, I'll, let's I, let's go have uh, two se two three four five i'll say what, do you have plants in the second no i guess it would be um i have in the third third so we'll go to yeah we'll go to the third so, i have jupiter and and, and moon Oh, did I, I skipped over that. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, this thing is glitching out a little bit. Okay. There we go. <laughs> All right. Uh, here we go. Jupiter. Oh, the moon, the moon's first. Okay. The one you, can you, uh, underline it so people can see it? Yeah. The one the the moon, one bereft of gladness and constantly <laughs> sorrowful, but respected by his beloved brothers and people. I think that's, that that's okay. That that's a friend of mine has that and it's very accurate for him. Which is which is interesting because the moon in the third, it's it, it's rejoicing house. Yeah, right. So I don't think he's taking that into consideration. No, I don't think so. Jupiter, a glorious man who overcomes scandal, is like a man of distinction. Like a man of distinction, not a man of distinction, and is respected by his elders. That falls in nicely, I think. Okay, cool. I have something in the fifth. Do you have anything? No, in the fifth, no. I don't have anything until the 11th, so don't worry about it. All right. Um, so I have Saturn. Saturn in the fifth makes a timid man whose son is really another's. <laughs> <laughs> and his body you're, you're, is frequently... You're going to have a stepson. <laughs> yeah, and his body is frequently punished because of his own bad qualities. Um, again, I would say that that's in a way true because i have based on my thoughts like made myself suffer bodily more than i need to um and then it says in the fifth is occupied by saturn sun or mercury or aspected by them um or is in the sign of exaltation of one of them while mars is weak in the house of one of them then it is well known that the natives are childish i i have actually oh that's me right there i have this almost exactly actually i have well. that also too Wow. So, uh, yeah, because Mars is weak in the sign of Saturn in the sixth, arguably. So I'm probably not going to have kids, which I don't even want to. So it's not, it's not a big deal. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you have anything in the sixth? No, I don't have anything until the 11th. Okay, I do. I have, um, I have uh, Mars and Venus. So... Uh, Mars in the six produces one who is tormented by blows of swords, diseases of the eye, illnesses, and burning. Great. <laughs> I've had a lot of heartburn. Oh, really? Yeah. Over the years, Mars in the six produces a man whose body is wounded by fire, blood, and swords. Why is it? Why is it giving me two Mars in the sixth? Badly diseased, tormented by fear of his enemies. Jesus. Or it just repeats that same shloka or something. I don't know. Which contradicts the idea of that Mars is good in the sixth. I, I guess, you know. Yeah. Jupiter and Venus, a patient man who is free of hatred and fear of his enemies and whose body is relaxed. Well, luckily, my Venus does kind of mitigate some of that Mars stuff. It's true, but still uh, kind of difficult. Um, then I have, I have Mercury in the eighth. Um, does it have the eighth? Yeah, there it is. Okay. And you have the sun in the eighth also. Yeah, that's right. Sun, one who is apparently worse than the moon in the eighth, which produces one whose body is bound, struck, and injured by hunters. But the thing is, is later in Yabanajataka, the sun in the sign of Mars, which it is in my chart in the eighth, is actually very, very good according to this same text. So we'll have to talk about that when we get to those chapters, how a lot of the significations when you, when he, he combines it with sign placement change relative to this chapter yep. change radically. So 
I also have Mercury there. So Mercury in the eighth place causes the birth of men without pain or disease. God bless. <laughs> Long lived persons who give love, favor, firmness, and pleasure. So, I mean, arguably it, these two are canceling each other out in my chart because I've never been particularly super ill, but I've also, I've been ill and I've had, you know, afflictions, but I've never had to have like a major surgery except for wisdom teeth, luckily, for example. Me too. Cool. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, I have met people my same age who've had major surgeries, so it does happen. Okay. Then, then I have, uh, I have something in the 11th as well. So you Jupiter, have, right? Yeah. yeah. But it looks like Mars. Mars is first. Mars, a man of unrighteous Adharma behaviors who suffers many losses and difficulties. Okay. Okay, Jupiter, one who um, loses his righteousness and makes few movements? Yep. No, that's the 12th place. Somehow it skipped down. Jeez. Oh, you skipped it? Well, I don't know. Oh, no, I, this is the 12th place. I'm sorry. You got to reread yours. This is the 11th place. Oh, okay. My Mars, bad. a man who is wounded by fire and thieves. Even better. Okay. Jupiter, the twice born. Cool. No, no. Jupiter, the twice <laughs> dot, born. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> the twice born. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So then you have some 12th place. Sun stuff. and moon. Uh, sun and Venus. I'm sorry. The okay. sun in the 12th places produces a man who serves others and acts as though vanquished. One who has lost his right eye. I have it here. And does not... <laughs> serve his own personality yeah i think that's i mean by seeing these videos that's pretty evident and venus an active person who loses his virility thank <laughs> Jeez. you couldn't you couldn't for me you you have to have that genital reference always okay all right well in the yavana jataka the influence of the places beginning with the second so that concludes our that concludes our video for today our third our third installment. Wow. Um, we're quite almost epic. at the middle part. We're, 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 we still have like four videos to go, but so far so yeah. good, man. I think. Quite epic. Nobody has done this before. So, you know, David Pingree is laughing from heaven. Yeah. And was David Pingree the guy who like didn't believe in astrology? I mean, man, how can you not <laughs> believe? I mean, that, translated that's, that's all this stuff. Torture. That's like torture. I don't think, like, you know, how can you translate so many books about these things and not like it? I, I think these were old, uh, the term is called uh, crypto astrologers or crypto okay. people who practice this maybe or, or like it uh, and hidden away, they, they like it but they don't show it because obviously there are, they are academics. Right. And also the, the project who translated in the beginning of the 20th century, this project that translated all these Greek um, texts, I forget the name of the project. It wasn't Project Hindsight, was it? No, 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 no. This is early. That's later, right? Okay. These were oh, like academics okay. who translated all the major, all the, the works on astrology uh, in Greek that were in all the major uh, libraries. Oh, it wow. Uh, but it was uh, for a historicist purpose, not necessarily an astrologer. Yeah. So they did, did uh, translate it, and then they said, oh, but this is just bogus. This is just, you know, the ancient uh, superstitions. Right. We don't need that. We are modern now. We have, you know, we have the nuclear bomb and Coca-Cola and pornography. So we're more advanced than these people. So, yeah. Uh, and um, Bingri was like a genius. So he, yeah. I, I'm, I am aware that he mentioned that he didn't uh, publicly, he didn't uh, share the beliefs, but he academically, he constantly works on it. So it's, you know, you never know. I guess we have to read his biography or read his mail yeah, to sure. really know about it. But it, 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 it strikes me as weird or strange that someone it, who does this regularly is not fascinated by it. So, yeah, I guess, I guess we can make a video on him 
uh, some some other time when we read like something on his life, sure, which is very interesting because he is probably very important for astrology in the twentieth century. Oh yeah, supremely. As as well as, you know, probably the three biggest. I mean, I don't, I don't know a lot about his life, so I'm not going to talk a lot about him. But yeah, I don't know. The major, major astrologers of the 20th century, without a doubt, Jung and, and Dane Rudyard are right there. Uh, and maybe from an academic point of view, him, but I don't know a lot about his life, so I can't. Yeah. So, but maybe we should get a book on him about his life and read it and then discuss it. That would be nice. Yeah, perhaps perhaps we'll do that. Um, and sure. for those of you who don't know, Pingree is the translator of this particular. Oh, definitely, we, we did. that we're using David Pingree. Um, so, well, yeah, that that about does it then. Um, you know, hit like, subscribe, share this with all your friends. You know, and we're um, gonna be, be we're gonna keep doing this until we die. Yeah, until we die. Uh, check check out our websites and stuff for individual readings and more, and check out Fernando's YouTube as well. And um, otherwise, yeah, just, you know, start reading the Yavana Jataka if you haven't already. All right, man. Well, I'll see you next time. Take care.